Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala ba'd. Thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, in theme, in the theme that we are talking about today is uh, already, you have already listened to Sheikh Saad talk to you and brief you on the issues of Ramadan and what pertains, what not to it. Now, I know that it's quite normal for people. Let's see how long this goes. So I know that for a lot of people, they think, they think that every lecture that builds up to Ramadan is going to be like, make dua for Ramadan, no, make dua, not for Ramadan. Ramadan doesn't mean you don't need to make dua for Ramadan. Make dua that you get into Ramadan. Make dua that Ramadan will be, blessed, it will be a blessing. Make dua that it will be a blessed event for you. But I don't want, okay, good. But I don't want to just simply uh, talk to you about how to prep uh, your way for Ramadan because that's your Imam's job, not mine. So what I want to talk to you about today is a lot of times in the build-up before Ramadan, we have so many different khutbahs and lectures about seeking forgiveness in Ramadan, right? We're always talking about Allah's Rahman, Allah's Rahim, and all these things. And we're always focusing on people need to do tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But today, what I want to move, I want to move away from that uh, discussion and talk about what kind of things can you do? What are the things that you can do that will cause other people to do tawbah? You see, you, see, you see how important this lecture is? And this kind of, uh, of a discussion, this kind of a discussion requires us to rigorously examine the seven categories that I'm going to be talking about of how we can help other people to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so in the month of Ramadan, as much as it is recommended for you to focus on your own self, your spiritual formation, right? And to better yourself and to do tawbah, so on and so forth. Don't forget that Ramadan is also a month in which you affect other people. A month where you affect other people. So I want to start off with a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu in which he says, he says that there were two people, there were two people they got into an argument. How many of you know what I'm going to talk about? Okay, so only one person knows? Okay. Two. Alright. Two people got into an argument. So apparently, from the context of what we know of, uh, there was one person that was kind of like a sinner, you could say it like that, and there was another person who was simply an advisor, advising him to stay away from haram. So this argument got heated, and more and more heated, and it just got really, really nasty. Until the person, so these two interlocutors, so the first one said, uh, by Allah, Allah will never forgive you. By Allah, Allah will never forgive you. Now I want you to, I want you to hold on to this statement. Just pause there for a second and think about this statement. By Allah, Allah will not forgive you. So on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to resurrect both people. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to the to this person who made this declaration, a person who decided to speak on behalf of the divine, he decided to become Allah's spokesperson by saying, by Allah, Allah will never forgive you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will rebut him. The Lord of the universe will rebut this man and say, who are you to take my name and say that I am not going to forgive so and so? Who are you to say that I'm not going to forgive so and so? For verily I have forgiven him and I have not forgiven you. So in this, in, in this selection, in this hadith that we have just talked about, what we can learn from it is that when we want to facilitate the dialogue of forgiveness, when we want to bring about change into people's lives, the result is not, you know, the goal is not for them to become good. A lot of people make this mistake. They just want that person to stop the sin. 
They just want that person to move from a state and then go into another state. So maybe they're doing a certain haram and they just simply want them to stop doing the haram. And I think, wallahu a'la, that that is only half of the equation. Because repentance is not just simply about the erasure of sin. Repentance is not only about the erasure of sin. Repentance is about restoring the relationship between one and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if there is no restoration involved, the person is going to fall back. So there has to be rehabilitation. There has to be counseling. There has to be patience. There has to be so many different factors to make sure that this person is there. So as the Hadith of Rasulullah says, that a person will sin so much to the point that he keeps going back and doing tawbah until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will just forgive him unconditionally. And I think that is what is more important. Because a lot of times, we get someone to change, they change, alhamdulillah. And guess what happens? They fall off the bandwagon three months later. And then you get frustrated, and what happens? You start treating them in a negative way. Or, you just leave them alone. And this is something that uh, in the next uh, uh, 30 minutes or so, we're just going to go over different points on how uh, to bring about uh, repentance. <clears throat> Number one, if you want to make positive change in someone else's life, you cannot ever belittle the significance and the impact of dua. And I know that this is an issue that a lot of people talk about. Dua, dua, dua. So we dua, make dua. But, but how many of us have actually uh, tasted the meaning of what dua is about. Dua is not simply about just calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then saying, oh, well, you need this. That's not the point of dua. Dua is not just about getting what you request. Dua is the process of asking Allah. It is that act of going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking Him, the act of putting yourself, surrendering yourself, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Oh Allah, there is no one else in this world that is in existence outside of the universe or inside of the universe that can give something to me as perfect as what you can give me. So that act itself is what makes dua powerful. And many of us simply think of dua as a wasila, as a, as a means of getting what you want to do. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, uh, he, he made a dua one time. And he said, Allahumma surhali al ummah, oh Allah, give victory to this ummah by one of the two Umars. Umar Rai, one of the two Umars. And one of them is Umar ibn al Khattab, and the other one is who? Hmm? I can't hear you. Yeah, but what's his real name? Amr ibn Isha. Amr ibn Isha. Right? So. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, oh Allah, give victory to these two, two, two people. Even though Umar al-Khattab and uh, Amr ibn Hisham, they are the two worst enemies during that time, towards Islam. But did the Prophet wasallam only think about himself and say, oh goodness, these are the two worst enemies of Islam, and I don't want to have anything to do with these two people, and I don't even, you know, maybe even make a nasty dua against them. And I want you to think about this uh, when Ramadan comes up uh, in, in, in like 21 days or 20 days, you know, you might have a dispute with someone. You might have a dispute with someone, whether it's personal, religious, whatever it is. But the question is, do you truly love them for the sake of Allah that you would actually make dua for them? I was sitting with a friend with me in the taxi the other day. May Allah word him, but he always takes me to the airport all the time whenever I travel. And he was telling me about this problem that he has with this person and that person. You know, this person is this, and you know, he did this to me and did that to me. And then I, you know, I just said, you know what? I only have one question for you. Just one question. I said to him, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 years from now, does it matter anymore? 50 years from now, we will all be dead probably. And don't, and, and the question is, would you have the kindness in your heart to wish to see him in Jannah? 
If you don't even have that kind of kindness in your heart, then there's something wrong with your heart. So even the worst of the people that you just disagree with, at the end of the day, you want to meet those people in Jannah, right? You don't want to, you, you wouldn't even wish it upon your worst of enemies to be in a different state. So the Prophet he wanted to facilitate a catalyst of change for one of these two people. It would have been better if both of them had accepted Islam. And as you know the story of that when Umar bin Khattab entered the house of Arqam ibn Abi Arqam, Dar al Arqam, right? And Umar bin Khattab comes, and what does he say? And of course, the Sahaba are thinking that Umar is going to brandish his sword and he's going to say, you know, I'm going to kill you or something like that. And whoever is recording this video, please do not take that out of context. I will kill you. <laughs> so, so, what happened is, Amr al Khattab comes to the Prophet, and the Prophet grabs him by force. Not in a violent way, but he grabs him and he brings him close. And this is very, very symbolic that the Prophet could even bring an enemy of Islam close to him. That there is nothing in this universe that can prevent it from them, that can prevent itself from the mercy of Allah. Even the worst of the enemies can come close to the mercy of Allah. He wasn't like, oh, you are this filthy, whatever it is. He brings him close and he says, isn't it about time that you do tawbah to Allah? Isn't it about time that you return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the Prophet sallallahu now I'm not saying that you should grab your friends like that. No, you grab your friends like that. Isn't it about time that you stop doing this? And they probably attack you or something like that. But the Prophet knew Umar enough to do that, right? He knew him enough. And so he, so Umar said, Ashhadu la ilaha illa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, right? So make sure that you do lots of du'a for yourself in the Ramadan, as well as those whom you disagree with. Make du'a for those people, right? Even if it, it look, look at the story of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. He made du'a for his people 950 years. And some of us, we make du'a for nine months and we already complain why we don't get the results. The second uh, way, catalyst for repentance, brothers and sisters, is through kindness. We all know from the hadith of the Prophet that the Prophet was extremely kind during the month of Ramadan. A lot of people, they think that, oh, okay, so if I'm at the level 80% kindness, then that means I'm just going to go to like 100% kindness. The Prophet wasn't like that. He was 100% kind, and then when Ramadan came, he became 200% kind. We all know the story of that one woman. She used to throw trash in front of the house of Rasul and yet the Prophet despite all of this uh, ill treatment, the Prophet what did he do? Upon hearing that she was ill and that she was not, uh, you know, readily thrown trash in front of his house, what did the Prophet do? He actually went and visited her. And she was surprised by this. How many people out there do you know that you disagree with? Do you actually visit? Or do you have people in this community or in any other community that's like, oh, uh, I, I, you know, I'll forgive someone, but I never want to see them again. If they go to this masjid, then I'm not going to go to that masjid. The Prophet actually goes and visits her. And upon witnessing this kindness from the Prophet what does he, what does she do? She announces her repentance. She announces her repentance. For many of us here, brothers and sisters, if we were mil, uh, uh, ill-treated like that way, if we were treated in such a horrifying way like that, to be, to be treated and humiliated and scoffed at, you would probably be making some nasty dua against you know, Allahumma alayka me fulan bin fulan, you know, Allah can't use that person or something like that. Right? And so the Prophet ﷺ, he immediately recognized that there was an opportunity. The third example is uh, you, you bring about change in someone's life by being an example. By being an example. So I'm going to tell you a story of Malik ibn Dinar and a thief. And I've said this story before in other lectures. Malik, there's actually two stories about Malik ibn Dinar. The first story is Malik ibn Dinar and the black snake. That story is actually fabricated. That story is uh, actually fabricated. A lot of people, they go around, I mean, I mentioned this story one time, but I recently found that that story is fabricated. Anyways. But there is one story that is true, and that is the issue of Malik ibn Dinar and the thief. Allahu Adam. And so, Malik ibn Dinar is in his house, he's praying, he is uh, doing his salah in the middle of the night, and there's like a bevy, a group of young men, and they're just like hoodlums, you know? Hoodlums, hood rats, if you want to call them. Hood rats. So these hood rats, they're just like, wait, how do you say he's mouse in Urdu? 
So it's the opposite of a sneeze, not how chu, it's chu ha. That was lame. It's a hell of a lame joke. Pardon my French. All right. So, uh, so these thieves, they're like, hey, why don't you go into that house and thieve him? They don't even know who this, this house belongs to. So they're like, okay, we'll just meet you on the other side of the wall, blah, blah, blah. So this one thief, Tasawwar, uh, you know, he basically like jumps over the, the, the wall and he goes in and in the middle of the night and he's like trying to feel his way. And how dumb is he that he goes and tries to steal from a skull? And what are you going to find in a, in, a, in a scholar's house? Books, pens, dust, pencils, notebooks, and that's it. You're not going to find anything. So Malik bin Dina, he's in his salah, and he hears a thief come, he hears a thief has broken in and intruded on his house. Now like, uh, you know, like we do in Texas, <laughs> right? You know, you know the, 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 the NRA would be really happy. No, he didn't even have a gun loaded for him. All he did was he just turns around after salah, and he looks at it, right? And he says, don't you have any little bit of shame? You have entered into my house, you have broken into my house, and you are disrupting me, and I'm in the middle of prayer. So the thief realizes that he apologizes and he tries to leave. So Malik ibn Dinar is like, you know, you're not leaving. You're not leaving. You come in, I'll tell you when you can leave. So Malik ibn Dinar is like, oh. so he like strikes a deal with the thief, and he's like, okay, so how, so how can I leave? Malik ibn Dina, what does he do? Now, out of all the people, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about an intruder that comes into your house that could harm your family. Right? I mean, if a mouse came into your house, that's a death sentence for the mouse. Mom's gonna scream, right? And then she's gonna, you know, just run and ask for help, right? I mean, you know it's a death sentence for the mouse. You guys are not gonna go to sleep until the mouse is killed. That's for a mouse, right? So what about if a thief comes in and harms your family? Malik ibn Dina, what does he do? He pushes to him a bowl of water. He says, make wudu. Make wudu. He's like, okay, make wudu. Goes and sleeps up, makes wudu. He's like, okay, now you pray two raka'ah with me. And this is like in the middle of the night. Even the thieves of that time, they knew the blessings of tahajjud. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's not, that's not being like smart out, that's true. <laughs> Nowadays, you have people, they like do a little bit of sin. Why should I even pray? I'm already sinful enough. If I pray and go do a sin, then that just makes me a hypocrite. <laughs> so the thief, right, he goes and he prays two rakahs. And subhanAllah, this actually has a very good impact on this thief. He actually feels really, really good. So he says to Malik, and, so Malik at this time, after the salah is over, the two rakahs, I mean, what do you think about this? A thief standing next to you, that he just assaulted your house, and you're just like inviting him for prayer. So, so Malik ibn Dinar, after he finished the salah, the thief is like, uh, Malik ibn Dinar couldn't, he just says to him, you know, you can leave now. No, the thief actually feels good and he said, is it okay if I pray two more rakah with you? Now Malik ibn Dinar could be like, uh, sorry, get out. <laughs> no, no, he doesn't do that. What does he do? He says, Hani and Marina. He says, good, that's fine. He says, let's pray some more. And so they pray some more. And they pray all the way until Fajr. And there's already a change going on in this person's heart. And then Malik Nidal is like, okay, it's time for Fajr now, you should go now. And the thief's like, no, no, can I come with you for Fajr? And they're like, okay, sure, let's go. So they go to Fajr. They come back from Fajr. And then the thief is like still hanging around Malik. <laughs> <laughs> So Malik ibn Dinar is like, okay, you know, you can really go now. <laughs> so the thief is like, uh, and by this time the thief has already made a real tawbah by now. Simply through example. Simply through example, he's already made a tawbah. And he says, I, I would like to fast the rest, the remainder of the day. I would like to fast for the remainder of the day. As you know, in uh, fasting uh, for acts of devotion pertaining to fast, right? Siyah, pertaining to sunan fast, right? non-obligatory uh, uh, fast. We all know that the Prophet said that one time he woke up and it was, you know, Fajr, then he went back to sleep, then he woke up and then he said to Aisha radiallahu anha, is there any food in the house? And she said, no. So Prophet said, I have made the intention that I'm going to fast. 
So the condition is as long as you don't eat or drink between Fajr and Tawdhuhr, you can still make the intention to fast. This is for Sunnah, fasting, not Ramadan. Okay? So it's not like get up at 9 in the morning, okay, I'm going to fast Ramadan now. So this is for Sunnah and fast. So this thief announces, I'm going to make a fast, uh, make a Siyah. Now I want, you to, I want you to think about this. Through example that this man, Malik ibn Dinar, was able to bring about change to this person's life. Now he could have easily taken the road. He could have easily taken the road by grabbing and saying, Tupil Allah. Like repent to Allah. But he chose not to do that. He chose not to do that. He decided to take the high road and say, not that I'm saying that if anyone does that, that means a low road, but he took a different route, a different alternative. The fourth example is sometimes for a uh, change to come, there has to be some sort of unfortunate tragedy that has to happen. I'm not trying to say that that tragedy is there in order for you to change. I'm not trying to say that. I'm saying sometimes an event uh, will alter your life. It's meant to serve different purposes. And maybe one of those purposes could be to wake you up. So there's a real story that I've read, and I was extremely moved when I read this story. It was a story about one young man, and he had three sisters. He had three sisters. So he's sitting and driving his car in the hot desert, and there's one sister sitting here, and there's like two sitting in the back, okay? So they're driving through this, uh, this hot, hot summer uh, desert, and uh, he turns on the music, and you know, he's like starts listening to all this haram stuff. And one of the sisters, actually, you know, she's sitting back here, she says to him, you know, could you please just turn off the music? Right? Could you please turn off the music? Note, I did not say, please don't stop the music. <laughs> so anyway, this, this is not pun intended. So, uh, so she says, so she said, could you please turn off the music? Whereas Rihanna says, please don't stop the music. Maybe now you have to. <laughs> See, when you tell a joke, and you have to explain it, it's not a joke anymore. So when the second time you tell it, someone laughs, I'm like, that doesn't count. <laughs> so what happened is, so she's like, please stop the music, right? And he's like, oh, uh, what's wrong with you, man? You're so uptight. Why are you so, you know, so uptight? And you can't just relax for a little bit. Just, just you know, I don't know, just chill out for a little bit, right? Just chill out for a little bit. Right, sometimes you go to wedding halls, right? Sometimes you go to weddings and there's like all this music going on and you, you, know, you don't feel too comfortable and you're like, well, you know, just, 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 you know, just throw your hands up or something like that, right? <laughs> I don't know, just, just chill out. And so she's like, no, no, I don't, I'm not really comfortable with this, please, you know? And so what does he do? Instead of listening to her, instead of showing like, okay, you know what, whatever, what does he do? Him and his other two sisters start making fun of her. Oh, you're so dumb, you're so uptight. You're so rude. You're so stupid. You can't even chill out. What kind of, what kind of, like, you know, what kind of person are you? Why are you like this? And so she continues pleading. You know, I don't want to listen to you. Can just please turn it off. And then he says to her the following words: If you don't want to listen, then you can get out of the car and go home yourself. So she became patient and she became quiet. And she just simply shut her mouth, exercising her right to be patient. You have the right to remain silent. And so what happened? They're driving, 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 and she's doing istighfar, she's you know, doing tasbih, doing dhikr, and then suddenly one of the tires blows up. And the car gets into this horrible mess, and it flips, and it turns, and turns, and turns. And then when the ambulance comes, they pull the bodies out. Everyone survived except this girl. Everyone survived except this girl that was sitting over here. This sister. And until the day of judgment, this man is going to remember that the last words that he said to his sister were not just simply hurtful words, words to taunt. But he said, if you don't want to, then you can go home. Now I'm going to ask you one question here. Where is our real home? Where is our real home? That's where we aspire to. And subhanAllah, when he said, go back to your home, Allah took her home. And because of this event, not saying that this was an amazing event, I mean, someone died. 
But the fact of the matter is, this event caused him to change. Now, I'm not trying to say that we, you know, we need these kind of shock treatments and this kind of scary stuff for us to do toba. That's actually really, really not so great. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about how sometimes when we don't listen and we don't obey and we don't notice the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will send another sign, one after another, sort of like take a hit. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا نُرِيهِمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ إِلَّا هِيَ أَكْبَرُ مِنْ أُخْتِهَا وَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِالْعَذَابِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ And we will send them one sign at a time. And if it doesn't work, then the next sign becomes bigger. And it becomes bigger, and it becomes bigger until a horrible punishment comes. For what? So that you will come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's so sad, because if you think about the way of a person who's sleeping, right? If someone is sleeping, if you, if you, if you go up to them, you could be like, you could say their name, and then hopefully they'll wake up, right? If they don't wake up, what do you do? You might, you might poke them, tap them gently. Right? And if, you don't, if they don't, what do you do? You might, you might shake them or yell at them or something like that until they wake up. So like, you know, you can wake up a person who's sleeping, no matter how deep in a sleep they are, but you can never wake up someone who's pretending to be asleep. So when, this, so when we are pretending to be asleep, when the signs of Allah are coming to us, reminders are coming one after another, and we still don't pay attention, you know that one day, some horrible sign is going to come to you and it's going to shake things up. How many times have you heard of people, Astaghfirullah, they got into a car accident and their life changed after that? Hmm? Put your hand up. <coughs> Not like this, but like this. Okay? Okay. But why is it, brothers and sisters, that we need this kind of painful experience? Why is it that we need something horrible to come to our lives and they're like, Ya Allah, I don't listen now. Take a hit from the first time. He didn't take a hit from the first time when he told her to, to, uh, to stop his music. And he continued in his arrogance. But then alhamdulillah, even when she died, right, the heart changed, suddenly realized. Suddenly realized. And so what we learn from this example is that in order for you to facilitate change, sometimes it just requires patience. Sometimes it just requires a little bit of patience. And if you're not patient enough, you can't expect someone to make that uh, change for their life. Okay? Thank you. Moving on. Sometimes another catalyst for change and repentance can only happen after you reach a certain level. Like, let me give you an example. A lot of parents are really overprotective of their children, right? Oh, don't do it. Oh. But the thing is, if you want your kids to grow up, then you're going to have to let them make mistakes. Sometimes they're just going to have to fall on their face. Sometimes they're just going to have to be embarrassed. Sometimes they need that, and they're going to wake up. Right? And so the thing is, is that sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow someone to change until they get to a certain level until they get to a certain level. I'm going to tell you a story about a, a brother that I know of in Tennessee. He is in the Riverbend Maximum Security Bureau. A real story, awesome story. 15 years old, runs around, hood rat, right? Then, of course, then, ex-hood rat. There's an ex-hood rat, he's like running around, and, he's, and he goes in, he takes a pistol, and he only puts one single bullet, one single bullet. And what he would do is he would go to like into the 7-Eleven, he would go to into the gas station, whatever his mini mart, and all he would do is fire one shot. Everyone get down on the floor with one shot. Nice. Perfect time for to make that noise. I have no idea who made that noise, but thank you. <laughs> so he would just go, uh, he'd just like, and he'd be like, everyone get down on the floor, everyone's like diving down to the floor, they're like screaming, and he would just want to, you know, move to the cashier register, open it up and take all the cash out and just like walk off. And he would do this over and over again. Until one day, it was the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he walks into a store and he raises his arm. What do you think happens? I'm not gonna say shit on my It doesn't happen, it's not that good. What does he do? He fires the bullet. 
But this bullet, it hit, ricochets off a pole, it hits another pole, and then it hits someone in the head. The fact that it ricochets once, and then twice, and then goes into someone's head. Are you telling me that this is just simply a coincidence? Hmm? This is just simply a coincidence? It could have gone through the metal. It could have ricocheted off and then bounced off, right? But it had to hit in a certain way that it hit it, and then it had to hit back and still had enough speed to come back for a third trip into someone's head. Instantaneously killing this one young man that was in the store. So where do you think he goes? Right, he goes into the slot. He goes into the slot, and he's there for like 17 years. And during this time, brothers and sisters, uh, this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides him to Islam. Question is, how many of us here have even visited your brothers and sisters in prison? They are our brothers for God's sake. When I visited that jail, by Allah, I felt that the brothers in jail, the Muslim brothers, they were freer. They were demonstrating more liberty than those that are free men and women walking around outside. So this young man, he came to Islam finally, and then what does he do? Of course he does tell about everything, and then he goes ahead, and then he, this is such a coincidence. He basically tells his friend, he's like, I really want to know um, who is this person that I killed, because I never met this person. So he tells his friend, and then his friend goes on Facebook, he's like, you know, my friend, blah, 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 he's in jail, and his name is this, and this is what happened. And subhanAllah, out of nowhere, it just so happens that the sister of the boy who was killed, somehow, it just so happened that the, his friend's Facebook page was also open and public, the wall was open, you can see it. She somehow finds that page. And she reads it and she's like, that's, that's my brother I think that this post is talking about. I think this is talking about my brother that was killed like 17 years ago. So she, so, she, uh, email, so she messages and she writes a letter to, um, uh, uh, she messages God on Facebook. She's like, I think you're talking about my brother here. I think you're talking about my brother. So they get the address and she corresponds. She's like, I didn't know much about my brother. Tell me about your story. So they start this correspondence. And this young man, this Muslim young man, he's like, you know, I did this and this and this and this. You know, I'm really, really sorry. This was never my intention. I have repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I really, really want change. And then the next letter that comes, she says, I forgive you. Now, imagine if this event didn't happen. What do you think is going to happen to him? He's going to continue going around and shooting up 7 Elevens, going to continue on shooting up at these places. But it was only after that he did this other sin that the guidance had to come from him. It's not a really, really, you know, amazing way of getting into the guidance, into the road of Islam through murder, but he still came into Islam. I'm going to ask you one question right now, brothers and sisters. As a community here, as a community here, what kind of systems have we set up here in this masjid or in Chicago that if there was a Muslim brother that walks out of jail tomorrow, that you're going to have a halfway house for them. That you're going to welcome them into your community and not judge them for what they have done before Islam. How ready is this community? Or are you going to ostracize them and be like, oh, we don't want to deal with this person because he just came out of jail. This is, you know, it's, it's easy to sit there and talk about, you know, five salah, Allah, alhamdulillah, okay, alhamdulillah, good. But what about those brothers that come out of the jail? Who's going to help them? You know, hardly anyone visits them in jail, you know that? Hardly anyone visits them. And they're just sitting there, and they don't even have someone to come and teach them about Islam. They're just teaching themselves, among themselves, and learning among themselves. The next thing that I want to talk about is, uh, we just have two more points, inshallah, I promise. The next, way, the next way of catalyst for repentance is through knowledge. And when you go through the month of Ramadan, you're hearing the sermons, use that knowledge to benefit yourself and benefit those around you. I'm going to give you a real story. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. It's the story of Abdullah ibn Maslama al-Qa'nabi. Al-Qa'nabi. I love saying his name because it's so fun. 
So Abdullah ibn Mas'ad al Ta'labi, if you look if you look at his seerah, if you look at his biography, you will find that Abdullah ibn Mas'ad he used to be a drinker. Hey Abdullah, you didn't notice yourself. Who my friend? Always my friend. <laughs> I mean, so Abdullah ibn Mas'ad al Ta'labi, he used to be what? A little bit of mood? Right? You drink a little bit too much. He was like walking around town and bustle like drunk and this and that, right? Like, you know, basically the hood around again. So he's like drinking, and then he sees this one man on a donkey. Donkey, yeah, okay, whatever. I'm not going to give the equivalent to a car. Because some people might be offended. How dare you compare to my car to a donkey? So I'm not going to do a comparison, okay? So he's just riding a donkey. So all these people are behind this person, and he's like, you know, with his bottle, his little wall hand, and he goes up to this donkey, just like grabs it like this, and he didn't say to the donkey, to be Allah, or something like that. He grabs the donkey, and he's like, he looks at the person on the, on the, on the, sitting on the donkey, he's like, who are you? And this was a big skull, his, he, he, this was a big skull, and he was na his name was uh, uh, Shu'aba ibn Hajjaj. Shu'aba ibn Hajjaj. So he said, what do you do? He's like, I work with hadith. I work with hadith. So he's like, Tayyib hadith me. Give me one hadith. So Shaman ibn Hajjah is very, very strategic. He wants to bring about a change into this person's life. So what does he say? He said, he narrates a special hadith and he says, حدثنا منصور عن ربيعي بن خراش عن أبي مسعود البدري أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن مما أدرك الناس من كلام النبوة الأولى إذا لم تستحي فاصنع ما شئت. So he picks his hadith on the authority of uh, Mansur ibn uh, Rabi'i ibn Khirash on um, ibn Mas'ud al-Badri, the Prophet says that from one, there's, there are certain ahadith that used to go around, even the other prophets of the past, they used to have the same. They used to have the same. Sort of like you, know, you have the golden rule, right? Do unto others what you want others to do. Hmm? Unto? Unto yourself. Right? So there's another hadith that was passed, that was there, a lot of prophets would say it, and uh, the, the Prophet he says, from among those who would receive the prophethood, they would say this one hadith, If you have no shame, then do whatever you want to do. Basically, if you have no shame, then you end up saying whatever you want to say. So when he hears this hadith, it sort of clicks. Now, Shuma ibn Hajjaj could have said something like, Allah ghafoorur rahim. Now what's going to happen if he said that? Okay, keep drinking. Allah ghafoorur rahim. He could have said, Shadeed al iqab Allah is severe and punishment. Oh, well, to God, no one for me. Right? But he chooses one hadith that's very, very uh, special. If you have no shame, then do whatever you want. So he goes back into his house, right? And he tells his mom, he's like, I'm going to go out of town for a bit. He's like, you're going to go out of town? He's like, yeah. If my friends come, just tell him, like, you know, that I'm busy. So the first thing he does, he goes around and he starts asking, Who is the most knowledgeable person in the Islamic world? And they're like, Imam Malik. So he journeys all the way to Medina, and then he starts studying. And then he reforms himself, and he starts studying until he gets the entire, uh, until he gets the entire, um, you know, ijaza from Imam Malik, and he narrates Muatta. And then he says, who is the second most knowledgeable person on earth? And guess who they said? Huh? Shu'ab ibn Hajjaj. The guy who was riding the dog. So he's like, Shu'ab ibn Hajjaj. Off to Basra. So he goes into Basra, he's like, I'm here to look for Shu'ab ibn Hajjaj. Where is Shu'ab ibn Hajjaj? Hmm. Any guesses? Huh? Any guesses what happened to him? He passed away. He's like, Shu'ab ibn Hajjaj passed away? And what happened? This, if you look in Abdullah ibn Masr al-Qa'nabi's seerah, you will find that 
He has only narrated one single hadith from Shu'ada ibn Hajjad, and it is this hadith. This one single hadith that he learned from Shu'ada ibn Hajjad in his time of ignorance, that propelled him to change. So technically, in, if you look in his uh, biography, they will say, who were his teachers? They will say, Shu'ab ibn Hajjaj. How many hadith did he narrate from him? One. Just one hadith. So brothers and sisters, when, you, when, you, when a lot of people when you are doing da'wah to other people, right? Be very careful in how you approach them in da'wah. A lot of times, you know, we go and approach like Christians or Jews or whatever it is, or people of different faith, and the first thing you're going to talk to the Christians is like, Trinity is wrong. Seriously? That's how you're going to open up your statement? Is that how you're going to open up your statement and bring them to Islam? The Trinity is wrong? Seriously, like, for me that I've studied two years of Christian theology, it's like there's different types of Trinity out there. There's different systems of Trinity. It's not all the same, right? It's not all the same. So we have to be very, very careful on strategy. Finally, I'm going to give you one uh, last beautiful story, and that is you can bring about someone to the tawbah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through forgiveness, and to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through fairness and equality. Ali bin Abi Talib, rahmatullah, uh, uh, ta'ala, he appointed judge by the name of Shuraih al-Qadi, and uh, Shuraih al-Qadi receives a case where one day Ali comes to him, and he's like telling him what happened. He's like, well, I'm, you know, I'm in the marketplace, the bazaar, whatever the mall you want to call it. And he says that I noticed that my body armor suit is being sold by this one Jewish gentleman. And I know that is mine. So he brings him to the court and he says, this is mine. And I don't know how he got it, but I want it back. Shurai al-Qadi, what does he do? He says, do you have a witness? Do you have a witness to prove that this thing belongs to you? He says, I do. So he brings his son. I forgot if it was Hassan or Hussein, one of them. So he brings one of his sons, and Shulay al-Qali says, okay, so what is this? He said, this is my father's, I recognize that this is his. So Shulay al-Qali says, you know what? I cannot accept this testimony because of course a son is going to testify for his father. Ali bin Abi Talib, he doesn't say, like, how dare you? Who do you think you are? I appoint you as a judge, and you're going to diss me like this? I'm just thinking about one particular country in my mind where they fire off all the judges. Okay. So, so he's like, he, he doesn't say like, oh, you know, I am one of the ten people promised Jannah. How dare you? He's like, okay. So Shulay al-Qali says, do you have another witness? He brings a servant. So the servant says, yeah, this is his. I prepared it for him. I put it on his saddle. And then I went to went to battle and it appears that he lost it. So the Shulay al-Qali, what does he say? Well, a servant is definitely going to speak on behalf of his master. I don't mean every father doesn't have a snit. What does he do? He simply walks out. He wants the judi judicial process. I was about to say jujitsu. He wants the judicial process to go through, right? Even though he knows that he's on the truth, he lets it go through. Upon witnessing this, the Jewish man is so shocked at the fairness of Shuraim that he's operating by principle, not by connection. So what does he do? He's so moved by this, and he said, you know what, you're right, I stole it from you, and just by witnessing this fairness, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. Now Ali bin Abi Talib could have been like, ha ha, God you now, confession. Right, what does he do? He's like, I forgive you. And then the, the, the Jewish man, he says, you know, you can take it back, it's yours. Ali bin Abi Talib looks at it, and he says, because you have done tawbah, it is yours, I give it to you as a gift. Now brothers and sisters, all of these uh, seven examples that, that we have talked about, okay, uh, that we have said through dua, through kindness, through example, uh, through patience, uh, resulting into a tragedy, through another sin, uh, through knowledge, as well as through fairness. Tonight, and until you get into Ramadan, I want you to think about the way how you behave with those people that are around you, how you can affect them in a good way. You never know that maybe by doing such and such a thing, an act of kindness before Ramadan, that when Ramadan comes, a person will actually turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repent to him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, 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 wa ta'